Hi dear friends, this is the introduction of our new video. I started doing a series about uh, Udang culture. Actually, I started writing a book about it. And then eventually I decided I should also make a video reportage of some of the research that I kind of put into the book. And the book is still forthcoming uh, because I haven't found time to publish it in a format that I liked. But the videos actually are doing pretty good. The thing is though, it is much more material than I ever anticipated. Um, I have in the first four videos basically spent time on discussing the founder of the Ming Dynasty and uh, why he is so important for the relationship between students and teachers in Kung Fu and uh, how it comes that our Kung Fu teachers, especially from Wudang, uh, who are relating very closely to statehood and empire and so on, um, are very much like him. Um, in this new video, we're going to go a little bit more far because we leave our four emperors, uh, our first emperor behind, and we go to the four following emperors, which were basically all siblings, and they were sons of uh, the original emperor founder. <laughs> As you might remember from the first uh, movies, uh, the emperor is called the Hongwu Emperor and his uh, family name is uh, Chu. Chu Yuanchang was his first uh, name. And there were four successive emperors in a period of, uh, say, 37 years. And the first one was from 1399 to 1402, and this was uh, Chen Wen. And then there was uh, from 1403 to 1425, there was the Yongle Emperor. Then there was the Hongxi Emperor from 1425 to 26, very short time, only for nine months. And then the Xuan the Emperor from 1426 to 1436. So he was actually a relatively long reigning emperor, although the Yongle Emperor also was relatively long. Um, the Chenwen Emperor, he had, like his father, the capital in Nanjing, but the Yongle Emperor moved to Beijing and they had a particular kind of building style. And this building style was also transported to the Wudang Mountains when they started building all kind of temples there um, because of the relationship with the Yongle and uh, Taoism and uh, Chang Sanfen. Chang Wen started his reign with a coup from his, on his father actually, and uh, he was very quickly succeeded therefore by the Yongle Emperor who went in rebellion. Yongle was then uh, succeeded by his son uh, Hongxi, but he also didn't agree with uh, Beijing, he left. And he tried to actually return to uh, Nanjing, but the court who just had gone through the traumatic experience of moving the capital from one city to the next, uh, didn't really feel good with that and one way or the other after nine months he was no more emperor he was no more alive also and then Sun De took over and uh, his name is also part of the name of my Sifu Sifu Yao Sun De and I always thought it was very in in interesting so we'll go into that eventually also but not in this video uh, so um, he further established the capital in Beijing and as a result of that, uh, since that time, Beijing has been the capital of China. And uh, Wudangshan was sort of like a shadow capital. In this period, some gradual changes were introduced into the Ming state. Um, and uh, the Hongwu Emperor might not have agreed with all of them. As you know from the last video, uh, at the end of his life, the Hongwu Emperor was a little bit paranoid here and there. So he pulled more and more things towards himself and he became like a micromanager, a little bit like uh, China is at this moment, also in a similar kind of state. Of course, Xuande, the one that I mentioned before, Xuande re-established a buffer uh, between the bureaucracy and the emperor. And this was a function of uh, grand secretaries. Grand secretaries had to advise the emperors on policy. And they uh, established uh, what is uh, called uh, Neko. Uh, this is uh, what is called the inner court. And inner court, of course, also is a very important concept in the changes of uh, Nedan alchemy in the Ming dynasty, which became much more abstract. And because so much closely all allied with the state, uh, the Neko, Neko, the inner court, is the place where uh, the spirits of our body uh, are gathering together and uh, make uh, decisions for you, mind, uh, your, you as a person who are the emperor, of course. The Yongle emperor, on the other hand, uh, who came before of that, 
is especially very important for Wudang because he gave this assignment to build all these temples. And uh, at this moment, when you come to Wudang, you can see that the temple areas, they're all from this style. The Ming Dynasty buildings are renovated, but the Tang Dynasty buildings and the Song Dynasty buildings that are there are still in a much more worse state than because uh, they represent a completely different kind of culture. Very recognizable for the temples of uh, Udang Mountains is the red uh, walls. Uh, this uh, cinnabar kind of walls, this uh, uh, iron oxide kind of color wall, stone color walls. Uh, these are the same as the walls of the Forbidden City are painted in. And these are very much uh, typical for this period of architecture. What I remember when living in uh, Wudang, everybody always talked about the Yongle Emperor and everywhere right, like, oh, he's such a great master and stuff like such a great emperor. And he did so much for Wudang Mountains. Uh, but at the same time, you have to not forget that he continued the military forcefulness of the reign of uh, the Hongwu Empire. Uh, and uh, this is uh, not necessarily a good thing, but it is also part of the attitude of the different Kung Fu schools in uh, Wudang Mountains. It's all very militaristic. As a pacifist, I had a very big difficulty with it, and I came there to learn about Taoism, because uh, at that moment uh, Wudang Shan was the most accessible, and also because my teacher, uh, uh, Liu, he referred to that. He said, like, you have to go there to finish your studies so that you understand very deeply what it is all about. And uh, I definitely learned a lot uh, over there and it really revolutionized a lot of my own personal thinking and changed me to a point where I realized a lot of the things that my teacher Liu told me I didn't really properly understood, understand uh, before and I came to understand them more. I understood some of the practices but the cultural context and the moral context behind them was uh, vague you can say. You see the young emperor, he did a lot of things. He did not only build this, he also sent out the eunuch uh, Chang Ho uh, to establish ties with uh, countries like India, countries in Africa, he went to Australia. And there was even a story about uh, Chang Ho if uh, the next emperor wouldn't have cancelled uh, his exploits, then he would definitely have been sailing into uh, Lisbon in Portugal one day because he was traveling more and more and he was following the coasts and getting further and further from China. So then China would have discovered Europe and everything would have been completely different. And this is a little bit what you see in modern Chinese politics. They say, well, this would have been our heritage and not your heritage as a sort of a envy between China and the West. One other thing that I think that is very remarkable is that the exploits of the eunuch Cheng Hua and his travels throughout uh, the African and the mainland continent, but especially Cheng Hua, of course, through the sea. Uh, when you think about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative follows to a large degree the exploit of Cheng Hua during the ocean travels. Xi Jinping, in that sense, is definitely inspired by uh, Cheng Hua's work for the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, to at least a part uh, recognizing you know what is really important and he sees in his heart probably this as the influence sphere of china where china should basically uh, lead what stayed in that time was the tribute system and you see there's also now that china is basically trying to establish a tribute system where the countries which are client states of china one way or the other they're not going to get conquered uh, but they have to pay tribute to sort of a tax to make sure that they don't that they don't get conquered probably something like this uh, the loan system that they use internationally is also a little bit based on the idea like okay we make you a dependent so that means you owe us and you have to pay us tribute and that can be a vote in the vn or it can be anything else uh, to make sure that we stay off your back all these four emperors they privately adhered either to buddhism or taoism and uh, they did so uh, in a private setting in the public setting they adhered to uh, in the public life anyway they held on to neo-confucian orthodoxy and neo-confucianism seems very interesting because it merges a little bit with ideas on buddhism and taoism and more taoism than buddhism probably and it takes a sort of analysis of the psyche or the mind and the sense of reality from buddhism um, so that is very interesting but they're also sometimes a bit uh, radical in some uh, 
some thinking. Uh, the Yongle Emperor, for instance, he supported uh, the Da Chuang, uh, that is uh, the great uh, books. Um, and these are a bunch of anthologies and commentaries on the famous new Confucians, uh, Cheng Yi and Zhu Si, to promote uh, moral values and ethical behavior. We're going to talk about these topics in a bit. Um, these principles, they are very strong in Wudang Taoism, and uh, they said without studying uh, Confucius, you can't study Taoism. And that is basically what the emperors also basically suggested. Like, okay, uh, Confucianism is a doorway that includes everything, and then you can go further into, say, Taoism or Buddhism uh, in that sense. So they, try, he, they tried, in a way, in their own private approach and in their public approach, to integrate Buddhism and Taoism uh, within this uh, Confucian practice, as Neo Confucianism, Co New Confucianism in general did. The great teachers of uh, New Confucianism were from the Song, like uh, Cheng Hao, Cheng Yi, and uh, Zhu Xi. Uh, further, also for Taoism, uh, in their Neo Taoism, which was influenced by then Confucianism, of course, uh, they go back to Lu Dongping, which is also from the Song Dynasty, and Zhang Sanfen is also from the Song Dynasty. Zhang Sanfen is supposed to be a student of Lu Dongping. Cheng Hao and Cheng Yi, they were brothers, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. Let's first talk a little bit about uh, Cheng Yi. Uh, he lived from 1033 to 1107, and he was a Chinese classicist. Um, and uh, he and his brother Cheng Hao then, of course, they both studied with uh, Zhou Dunyi. Zhou Dunyi is somebody who basically looms in the background, but is very important. Uh, he lived from 1017 to 1037. He was a cosmologist who was concerned with the concept of Taiji, and that idea was also picked up by Zhu Xi. Zhu Xi, I wrote extensive about in the book, about the uh, Wudang Mountains as uh, one of the inspirators of uh, the Wudang culture. Uh, this is Zhou uh, Yi. He emphasized the relationship between your behavior and the cosmos, the universe. And uh, that was a very important part. Uh, we see this also in the Neidan that we practice uh, from Wudang, uh, that uh, this relationship between ourselves and the cosmos is uh, being integrated uh, to a large degree. This integration is a very important part of Zhongwu Qigong actually uses this actively cosmological training to make sure that you have a good understanding uh, of yourself in relationship to the universe and then you try to model yourself to the rulings of the universe and as a result of that you can understand the universe better and therefore adapt better and hopefully achieve immortality that is the Taoist part that Zhu Xi didn't conceptualize this Zhu Xi said that if you uh, master what is called uh, Shen Qi, uh, which is your uh, supreme awareness or your divine awareness, then you can reach unity with all of nature. And uh, we do this uh, through Ling Bao practice, the Ling Body practice, actually, um, which is part of the Zhongmu Qigong. He popularized the common Tai Chi diagram also. He exploited the ID, which is also done by other people. Cheng and Zhu, Cheng Yi and Zhu, uh, were the founders of what is called the rationalist school of Neo-Confucianism. And uh, Zhu there being the architect of Neo-Confucianism. So it means that his ideas penetrated most far. And I think if I remember well, I have a video about it. So I'll put a link also in there if I can find it. There. Let me explain a bit about uh, Cheng Yi. Besides being a conservative, who was not really in favor of women, uh, he also had some interesting theories. His principles of morality, in that sense, they are still used up to the modern day. Uh, when I went to China, uh, all the women that I've talked with, uh, and I did a lot of interviews for my research also, uh, they all emphasized their dependency on family principles and so on. So for this, you have to look at my uh, videos also about uh, family uh, to understand what is actually meant with that. And so don't think about your own family as a compensation for that. Uh, it's, it's all about the extended family, the patriarchy in that sense. What has caused this is that uh, many widows, they lived very lonely lives and they died uh, sometimes by suicide. And uh, that is not completely gone yet. Although women are much more free nowadays to do as they want. They do that mostly by moving to the big city and then staying away from the village where they actually used to live. Cheng Yi's uh, brother Hao, he was a dualist. He saw divinity between things. 
Um, and he called these things the tangible things and the intangible things. And the intangible, he believed all to be uh, like a holy things. Um, he saw this as a god or spiritual kind of a force. The intangible is all like that. And they, he saw this all as a unified uh, thing. For people, it is based in our feelings. So our feelings are very important. If our feelings are scattered, we can't experience these kind of things. Yeah, you have our human nature also, uh, of course, rooted in our feelings to a large degree and therefore also has a big influence on it. And his ideas there can be called pantheistic. And this is also why I very often talk about these kind of pantheistic things in relationship to Wudang Taoism, because Taoism as a whole already is pantheistic. And you really see the influence of Taoism on Confucianism in that, of course, Confucianism stems from a time when everybody was pantheistic. So the ideas that modern culture tries to impress on Confucianism as a as a secular way of thinking, like what the Chinese government tries to do, uh, that is of course a bit of a fallacy as a result of that. One more thing that he suggested is that we only see things and people doing things, uh, but we cannot uh, see the action itself. So the action itself is belonging to the uh, uh, how do you say the intangible things and these intangible things therefore become important so when we play Tai Chi Chuan for instance uh, people can see us move but they don't see how we act they can't see what we are actually doing I very often say like Chi you can't feel right um, and uh, one of the reasons like this is because of the, what uh, Chang Hao suggested namely that uh, Chi is uh, something uh, that can be seen as a shadow, a little bit like a platonic idea of reality uh, that we see is the shadow of the reality that actually is, but it is not the same. Uh, because uh, he basically says the action in itself that we can see is not the act action that we do, right? So uh, I can see you do something, but I don't know how or what you're acting actually. So um, the world that we see is uh, an appearance basically of your intentions. And in uh, Tai Chi Chuan, uh, what we try to do is we try to make our intention and our actions visible through our movement so that people can understand actually what we are doing. That is called clarity in uh, Taoism. Clarity and form, form and clarity, Qing, Xing, Qing. How suggested that outside Tao there are no things and outside things there is no Tao. So they, he basically said that the one includes the other. So the tangible and the intangible also, they include each other. We call things God when we see the mystery uh, of principles, so the Tao Li into the Yi Wan Dong Si in the, what we call the 10,000 things, but it is the one with four zeros things. Uh, we call it divine uh, or divine emperor Di. Uh, to show it as a ruler of events. And he also said that in viewing reality, uh, when it is changed in terms of principle, it is Tao. Chu Zi, who lived from 1130 to 1200, he was an origin, a calligrapher, a historian. He was a thinker and he was a politician. He was a poet also. So he was doing a lot of different kinds of things. And he reshaped Chinese philosophy by re-editing and commenting on the four books, the four books which are used for the Chinese exams uh, to get a place into the official courts, uh, to basically up your standing in the world, so to say. Um, this model of education still plays a big role in, the, in China, in a way, and also our CITO testing uh, are based on this uh, model. Mm. Of course, there is a base curriculum and this base curriculum was in that time the four books. Nowadays, the base curriculum doesn't include the four books also in China, uh, although people might refer to it. Um, anyway, the uh, Tuzi, he wrote on the investigation of things, which is called the uh, Gowu, and also on the development of meditation as the root of self-development. So this is also why in the Wudang area, uh, we still emphasize so much effort uh, to do so much effort for meditation because uh, without meditation that is not possible so as a result of that these three became the root for the development of Wudang Taoist practice uh, through Tai Chi Chuan through chastity and morality through panentheism pantheism and through meditation so this is also how Neo-Confucianism and Neo-Taoism uh, do join on the hip 
what we see is that these uh, three emperors, uh, Hongwu, uh, Yongle, uh, Xuande, they have uh, all three, uh, through the patronage of Taoism, because of the development of uh, Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism, and uh, the theme that was being set for the Ming Dynasty as a Neo-Confucian uh, state, um, they have basically influenced also things like Wudang Taoist culture. And Wudang Taoist culture in itself, they became like a very large learning center for Taoism. So as a result that they influenced the whole of China. Of course, the different uh, princes or kings from the Tu Ming dynasty, uh, they influenced many more projects in uh, China uh, through their fandom of uh, both Taoism and Buddhism. In reality, we see that uh, the things that we now see, that we now study, we see that a lot of people, they study these things like uh, Taoism, they study the, uh, the learnings of, uh, of uh, Confucius and they study the learnings of all kinds of other things. They do not always see the interchange between the different interest groups in this culture, uh, how they interplay with each other. Uh, you see this in the way how people discuss the history of Tai Chi Chuan. And they just look at the physical art and the movements, where do they come from, who was the first, was it the general here or the Chen family or anything like that. The role of the Wudang Mountains in the formation of the thoughts around that is usually seen as being, you know, secondary, not important maybe. And I do not say that the people in Wudang now are necessarily the people who understand best what actually happened uh, with uh, Tai Chi Chuan history. Uh, I do think uh, some of them actually they have quite a good understanding. But we also see that the way how we Westerners interpret these things and what they actually mean uh, is very different from what they used to do in the past. Like for instance the I Ching, uh, James Legg and uh, Wilhelm, uh, they have both translated the I Ching uh, based on the uh, Qing Dynasty versions which were uh, ultra-orthodox so to say. But the Ming Dynasty, Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism, was already pretty much orthodox. And there were a lot of things that are stemming from the Song Dynasty, like with the thoughts of uh, the Chang brothers uh, about the role of women, uh, especially after the death of uh, their husbands. Not a good one. I Ching, in that sense, uh, of course, the, the fact that heaven is the core hexagram from the I Ching, you don't see that back in their translations. You see in their translations the westernization of their interpretation but you don't see this original id from neo-confucianism in there because of the lack of understanding of the chinese culture and you see this also in translation of concepts simple concepts like qi uh, jing uh, sing uh, uh, jing uh, a lot of different kind of concepts they all are done in a particular kind of confusion and we see that this confusion comes about because of westernization, but we also see that the change of things and meanings between the different dynasties in China, they play a particular kind of role. And so far we have only discussed um, three generations of the Ming dynasty. And so uh, in the next video we will do a few more. So dear friend, I hope you really enjoyed this video as you did with uh, other videos. Uh, I hope it is going to be of use to you one way or the other, uh, either in classes that you give or in your daily life, um, or maybe in communication with your friends that you have some new interesting tidbits to tell them. Um, they will all be great. If you have any use for this, or if you just think you should encourage me, it will be very helpful for the development of my channel. Uh, make sure you leave a remark below as a reaction like you know nice job or something like this or oh terrible what an asshole are you uh, doesn't really matter that much anything actually helps the algorithms to find my videos uh, i get a lot of compliments about the content of my videos uh, they also say it is very intense i have a lot of information every time uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah that is just the way how i roll so to say and i don't mind about that um but there are are, I think, a lot of people who would be interested or might have some use for the content of these videos, so I would like to grow the channel. So if you can, like, uh, join the channel if you're not joined yet, uh, leave a remark, that will be really very helpful. If you want to go a few steps further, uh, you can either sponsor the video on our Patreon 
through um, uh, a small donation every month. That will be really very helpful, certainly in these uh, crisis times. And um, you can also come to the classes. Uh, I will be there 100% of the time available for you to answer all the questions that you have and to also teach you as best as I can uh, the skills that you would like to learn. You can also study Chinese medicine. There's no problem at all. I also provide you with a course with a lot of unique materials uh, from which some of the items are being supported also by things that we talk about in these videos. Ciao, ciao.